Welcome, everybody. This is Hollywood Progressive coming to you again with Dick, Sharon, and Nia to talk about a play we saw a week or so ago called The Lifespan of a Fact at the Fountain Theater, probably one of our most favorite theaters here in Los Angeles. We never miss a show there. This one uh, was written by Jeremy Carrican, David Morrell, and Gordon Farrell. It stars Ron Botita, Inger Tudor, and Jonah Robinson, and it basically re revolves around the journalistic conundrum of how do you tell a good story and yet stick to the facts? What did you think about it, Nia? I thought the play was great. It was a really um, beautiful contrast between, there were only three, uh, three characters in this show, and it was very much sort of a battle between the author who made some embellishments in his piece and a, a, uh, a fact checker that the editor, the third character, um, had tasked to fact check paper. And you very quickly, it seems like an easy task, but very quickly it kind of unfolds into, well, what is a fact and how deep does a fact go? And you end up with these three characters caught in this exact conundrum of where does the truth of the situation end and where does the artistically placed, I don't want to say lies, but the artistically placed um, tweaks of the truth start to overtake and, and take away from the, the true meaning of the story. And I think that's something that I think Sharon could probably point a couple of events recently less recently, more recently, that have happened along those lines in terms of the facts and the truth being blurred for various purposes. Good points, Nia. That's right. Nia's absolutely right. You know, being a publisher of an independent um, digital um, news source, uh, the LA Progressive, and, and to a certain extent, the Hollywood Progressive, it's really incumbent upon me to make sure that whatever we publish is truthful. Um, Recently, well, right now, we're hearing about what's happening on Fox. So um, Dominion, the, Divin the Dominion Voter Systems um, is a company that provides for a mechanism for people to vote. And um, they are suing, Dominion is suing Fox um, as part of a, a defamation lawsuit. And um, some of the people that may be held accountable are big names like Tucker Carlson, Sean Hannity, and others um, for falsely claiming that uh, Donald Trump had won when, in fact, they were privately expressing disbelief about Donald Trump winning. So um, there has been um, information that has been disclosed that shows that the people that were reporting that Donald Trump won, they definitely did not believe what they were reporting, what they were reporting to be true. And so that's resulted in defamation lawsuits. And there have been other examples in history. I know when we were watching the play, I was thinking about this young man whose name was uh, Jason Blair, who was a writer for the New York Times. And um, Jason Blair was just really considered a rising star. Um, but back in, um, I'm, oh, it was in uh, 2003, uh, it turns out that a ton of what he was writing were just wholesale fabrications and combination of fabrications and plagiarism. And I, after we, after we saw this play, I went to, um, to YouTube and saw an interview of James Blair, and he talked about how he was dreading each day, every day that he got up, he was dreading going to work because he knew how much trouble he was going to be in. He knew it was just a matter of time before somebody found out about him. And it was partly because he was becoming so famous because he was such a good writer. So the, the more famous he got, the, the more afraid he was. And so finally he went to, um, to his local bar and he said, no one in the world knew what was going on with him except for this bartender. And he told the bartender, 
how much plagiarism and fabrication was involved in his writings with the New York Times. And his bartender said, you need to go and resign right now. And he took his bartender's advice. So I don't know, Dick, if, if you wanted to uh, say anything about the play as it relates to you being the editor of a widely read, certainly here in Los Angeles, California, in Southern California, a widely read digital publication and, and how that play impacted you. Yeah, so um, I don't know who's appearing here. Uh, I, I recall a, another famous story from 1980 uh, involving a, a young Black writer, Janet Cook, who was hired to the Washington Post as part of a push for diversity because the complaint was that all the big newspapers and magazines were people by, by white people. So she was bought on and she bought a, she, she wrote a very compelling story called Jimmy's World about a third generation heroin addict, eight year old heroin addict in Southeast Washington, DC in the black poor part of Washington, DC, Anacostia. Uh, and the story is still out, up, up on the web and I read it and, and it is, it's a beautifully written story. I would say knowing that every word of it was a fabrication. It wasn't, some of it was made up. It, the whole thing was made up. Janet Cook did not know an eight-year-old heroin addict. There might have been one in Washington, D.C. in 1980, but she didn't know one, so she made up. And if you read it nowadays, you can kind of see, well, it touches every elite white perspective of what how, how stereotype of how poor Black people live and heroin addicts are. It, it kind of is what I would say it's far too neat. But at the time, it was groundbreaking. It was featured on the front page of the Washington Post. It won the Pulitzer Prize. It launched a career until, like Sharon's story, the truth came out. Uh, she lost her job. A couple editors who should have fact-checked her article uh, were disciplined. Um, and it was a sad story. Now, the, the play that we're talking about it is, is is the fabrications aren't aren't that great, but but you do understand the the battle that the editor has, the Inger Tudor char character has. She, she has a magazine that is failing because the internet has come online and it's taking all her read readers away and all her advertising revenue away. So she has one very dull, fact filled story that she could run, or this fascinating story that an old highly decorated uh, reporter has put together that's very interesting about, about life in Las Vegas. And, and to do her due diligence, she brings a young college graduate on board. From Harvard. Who, uh, well, need I say anything <laughs> else? Who, 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 is, who just goes nuts with the fact checking and, and finds everything out in the, in the writer's point of view is you know he he has a has a line in there the fact checker says you say there were 34 strip clubs in vegas there are in fact 31 and the writer says well i like the balance of 34 uh i will say uh, uh we love going to the fountain theater the acting was superb the stage is wonderful i will say the characters in this play don't go anywhere they don't grow the fact checker is a fact checker at the beginning He's the same guy at the end. The editor is the same person torn by the same desires at the beginning. The writer, none of them give an inch. They kind of stay the same. It's not clear who learned what. Uh, anybody else have thoughts? Yeah, I was just thinking um, before we sat down to do this and leading up to this, I was also doing my own um, uh, research into other cases that this has happened in our real world. And I was hit with the same feeling that I got after watching the play. Again, like my dad said, um, really, really well done play. They do amazing things with this little set that they have available to them. The acting is superb, beautiful design, beautiful staging. All, it's all fantastic. Um, but I was also left with the feeling of, well, what do you do? And that's kind of how the play ended. It just sort of ended. There was no definitive, you know, 
um, yay, nay conclusion, and you're left with the question of, what do you do? How do you handle this? How do you even have this conversation? And I think the point of this play is to bring up that question of fact versus fiction. Where is the line? How important is it to stay close to the line? How far from the line can you go before it starts getting wishy-washy and edgy or just stepping away from the line? Even the quote that my father mentioned, you know, 34 strip clubs, but there's actually only 31. Like, that's a small difference. But it is a difference and knowing that you lied about that small thing opens it up to well what else did you lie about and it was just after doing my research on things that have happened in the real world i was very much left with i don't know how i feel about this like i don't know how far is it, is it okay to push the boundaries to fit how you want it to fit in whatever it is that you're writing and i think that's sort of the point of this play it's an untalked about topic, even though we face it, as Sharon mentioned, pretty frequently just with Fox News and some of the things that they um, put out there, and yet no one addresses it. There is no real, like, yes, this is where you have to be. And I think it's interesting in that sense, whenever there's a play that leaves you really questioning the subject matter, but in your own life. I think that's fantastic. Well, I think one of the things um, that the play brings up is that there are several agendas that are going on here. You have the young guy from Harvard who's trying to prove himself to the publisher and also to the writer. You know, this young guy from Harvard really admired the man who wrote this article and he felt honored and he felt like, oh, this is my opportunity. It was really his, he was an intern and it was his first opportunity to show this publisher what he could do. So his agenda was to shine for the publisher. Then you had the publisher who has to be concerned about satisfying and quenching the, the thirst of the reader community and also the publishers, um, the advertisers, because they want to keep their readership up so that they can keep the advertising dollars. So the publisher has that concern. And then of course you have the writer's concern who um, at his core, he's a creative type person. He's not really a journalist and in fact, he calls that out several times during the play. He keeps correcting people. I am not a journalist. So he calls his, his works essays and he's an artsy fartsy type. But then there are other issues that come up and this wasn't really even addressed in the play, but I was thinking about it. And I was thinking about the Overton window. And that is how um, publications have the opportunity to shape the ideas of a nation to change what is acceptable in governmental policies, to help to shape how policies are written. And I could see where this issue of someone jumping, you know, someone committing suicide, and I guess um, what we were learning in the play that there were actually more than one suicides, they could have the power to perhaps change policies on how the structures, the, those tall structures, how they're built, um, what they can do to stop suicides. I mean, the, the, the ramifications, like there are multiple ramifications. So this is not really an, an easy issue to address. But I think one thing is really clear. You can't just outright lie and paint it as if it's the truth. <laughs> yeah, so so part of the deal for me, so I, I, uh, as I got a, uh, I took a bunch of journalism classes getting my English degree a billion years ago, and and we were taught a certain structure in 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 a news story: who, what, when, where, how, and and a nut graph and a certain certain formula, and and the idea that you would have a fact in there that was anything less than you could, something you could prove was anathema. But but after that, uh, other forms of journalism can come along, like like gonzo journalism. You might have heard, certainly Nia hasn't heard of Hunter S. Thompson, but somebody my age has heard of him. And there the idea is more to tell a story, not to shade the facts, but to, it's more about a story rather than who, what, when, where, what, how. And and uh, and it makes for more interesting reading. And, and so there's long form journalism where there's, lots and lots of personality put into it and 
And uh, Truman Capote wrote a kind of journalism where he inserted himself into the story in a way that a traditional journal journalist would never do. It was uh, in Cold Blood, his famous story about interviewing the two murderers in Kansas. I mean, it was all about his long interviews with these two murderers and getting into their soul and revealing themselves, made for wonderful reading. There was even complaints about that book because he never took any notes when he had these long interviews. He said he had a picture perfect memory and he'd go back to his hotel room and write it all down word for word. And if you believe that, well, you, you, you might be fooled. Well, we don't want to make this uh, videotape any longer than it needs to. We want to encourage our readers and the visitors to the LA Progressive, that they should go to the Fountain Theater often. It is a wonderful playhouse right here in Southern California. And yep. currently the name of the play is? The Lifetime of the Fact, and it runs through April 2nd, plays on Friday and Saturday at eight, Sunday at two, Mondays at eight uh, through April 2nd. The Fountain Theaters at 5060 Fountain Avenue, Los Angeles. And thanks, Nia. Thanks, Sharon. We'll tell you about our next adventure soon. I want to, I just do want to talk about one thing that is fake here, and that is my eyebrows. I told <laughs> you, these are Zoom eyebrows. And I love them. Only problem is you can't turn your head. <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> That's it for today, guys. So long. Bye, bye, everybody. Thanks for watching.